The message is called Sin, Life, and Death. What's the biggest sin? What's the worst sin that a man can commit? What's the worst thing that one could do? Put that hand down, Sally. You <laughs> probably looked at the paper before I got here. You know, I used to get this confused, and uh, I think it was Adrian Rogers that I once heard say, what's the only sin that will send you to hell? There's only one sin that will send you to hell. Unbelief. It's unbelief. unbelief. Amen. Listen to my congregation. <laughs> That's because we preach the Bible around here. It's unbelief. It's not murder. Technically, it's not blasphemy, even though blasphemy is ultimate unbelief. So they're the same thing. That's where you get. This whole, uh, the unforgivable sin. There's somebody, there's probably several people listening right now on the radio that think they've done that. And they're just listening because there's still something yearning inside. And they're so sorry. Had a good friend, a young man that worked for us once that was convinced from his family and the church he grew up in that he would committed the unpardonable sin and he was lost forever, could not be saved. Broke my heart because he was haunted by that. Here's how I believe that you can know for sure you've not committed that sin. If there's still a yearning in your heart, you haven't broke ties with your father. Amen. Because when you commit the unpardonable sin, it severs the tie and you don't care anymore. And we'll come back to that. The biggest sin, it's unbelief. It opens the doorway to every other sin. Now, many people will say, I believe in Jesus, so I've got that taken care of. We talk about that just about every Sunday. There's so much more to that. Don't kid yourself. I want you to know this morning, because I want everyone listening this morning, everybody hearing the word this morning, to walk away from here today knowing that you're a child of Almighty God. Knowing that you... This is so important, and I say this with the greatest of joy in my heart. Knowing you have a God, the God, the Almighty God. Hey, things cannot get too far out of control for me. And I've lived in some pretty strange situations. We go through some of them presently. But God never leaves His throne. He's God. And in my mind and in my heart, because I stay in His Word and I submit to His Spirit, I rest in that truth. Amen. Now there's power in that. That's the, I, I, I don't believe that I'm to this point yet, but that's the same power, and it's in me, it needs cultivating, that's the same power that resides in the martyrs that are tied in a pile of wood and the fire is lit beneath them and they say, I will not deny the name of Christ. Because they know everything is in the hand of God. Amen. Oh, don't you want to go through life that way? Don't you understand by now that we're all slaves of Madison Avenue until you come to Christ? The car you drive, the handbag you carry, the boots you wear, the music you listen to, the TV show, everything you've got has been programmed in your mind. Come out of there! Stop living like a tail wagon on the end of a dog. There is no peace there. There's no peace there, and it's going to come to an end. You're not going to live forever in this flesh. It's all temporary. Stop buying that stuff. Hear the Word of God this morning, because I'm going to give it to you plain and simple. Unbelief. Unbelief. Think of this. If today, try to imagine this in your mind. Uh, we come under some other kind of rule. Uh, some other nation invades us. What, whatever happens. <laughs> Political parties get a little stranger than they are now. That would even do it. And imagine that speeding in your car was a zero tolerance crime. And if you were caught speeding, follow me in this, if you were pulled over for speeding, the officer would take you out and pummel you where you stand, throw you in the back of his car, and lock you up for 60 days where they would feed you, what is it called in the scriptures, bread of affliction and water of affliction. And beat you daily. Imagine, imagine if that were made the penalty for speeding today. Now you got that in your mind? How many of you would be a little bit more careful when you drive to Plainview? You'd be, you'd be, here's what you'd be, paranoid. 
You'd be afraid they're going to pull me over and I wasn't speeding. They're going to do this. That's believing this law has been put in place. You'd be scared to death. Let me tell you something. That has nothing in comparison to what happens to the man who does not put his faith in Christ. And yet we live through our life as though everything's all right. Most people will almost everybody, you go to the wildest nightclub in Lubbock at 1.30 on a Saturday night, and if you ask 100 people if they'd go into heaven if they died, at least 99 would say yes. And that other one would say, I don't care, I'm going to hell with my friends. That's the ignorance. But everybody believes they're going to heaven. They have no idea what they're talking about. That's unbelief. Don't you understand? That's unbelief. They don't believe that there's a precious Savior that died for them. They don't believe that someone has taken away the chains that make them have to go to the bar and spend all of their money. They don't believe that God has freed them from this, this hunger, this such a craving in them for love that they sleep with anybody that will look them in the eyes and their life is falling apart. They just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. God didn't make you for that. God didn't make you for that. He made you to thrive. Not in your dream. He made you. <laughs> i got to clarify that. God, this is, this is not popular, but I'm going to tell you the truth. This message that God wants you to have your dreams all come true. Get that out of your mind. It's not about you anymore. It's about Jesus Christ who bought you so that when you leave this fallen, broken world, you'll find out what you're created for. And you'll have total and complete fulfillment. That, the Bible calls it, and I wish I had the scripture in front of me, it says that is the Holy Spirit. That's the earnest or the down payment that is, that's what's in me right now. Amen. I have what Paul called a down payment that God graciously put in me. And I recognize it. I don't know when he put it in. I'm not sure. But I recognize that it was there 10 years ago. And that is when this Terry became this Terry. Amen. And do you know what one thing is that this Terry doesn't even do? He doesn't go, not interested back there anymore. That doesn't even call me anymore. There's a new life. Belief. Belief, you've got to understand it. We don't have a reality in our mind of sin. Go to Luke chapter 16. This story, I'm going to read it to you. For those listening on the radio, those watching online, Luke chapter 16, you'll be familiar with the story. Start at verse 19. There was a certain rich man. He was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, and he was full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell... He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is in comfort, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, listen carefully. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses. They have the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. 
Why do I bring that story up here? You know what parables are, where Jesus would tell a story to give an example of something. He gave a lot of them. I want you to notice these red letters here. This is not a parable. Well, what are you saying, Terry? Jesus is God. Jesus is the fullness of God. And when he's talking here, he simply says in verse 19, he doesn't say, let's compare the kingdom of God to a rich man. He doesn't say, hear this parable of. He said, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple. You know what that means? Do you know what that's saying right there in this chapter of Luke? Jesus is saying, listen to me. Some of you may have known Lazarus. Some of you may have known the rich man that he stayed at his gate all the time and he tried to find some food from him. And you saw how he was treated. Jesus is saying, this happened. And here's how it went down. That should cause some of us to pause. To realize, listen, someone you know who has died could very well be in that torment looking and crying out for mercy and there is no hope for all eternity. Now you can look back at that and get all shook up and broke down and you can look forward and start thinking about the people you love and your children and your grandchildren and your families, the people you work with that are still alive and breathing. That's why we're still here. We know of the one that was risen from the dead. And he said, did you catch the little subtle thing in there? This isn't the point of the message, but it's very good to note. This rich man says, after Abraham says, they have, basically what Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. He's saying, they have the word of God. They have the word of God. They don't need to go there where you are. They don't need to die and go to hell. And he says, no, 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 no. That won't do. If somebody rose from the dead, then they'll hear. And Abraham himself, Father Abraham said, if they won't hear this, they won't believe one who's risen from the dead. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. Now here's a stark reality for somebody listening. If you don't know the Word of God, if you don't let the Holy Spirit in you teach you what God has said, this is the Word of God. Revelation 19, 13 says, His name is the Word of God. His name's not Bible. His name is what's in this Bible. If you don't come to this, not the Book of Mormon, if you don't come to the Word of God, not what the church tells you, if you don't come to the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit speak to you, you will not believe on Jesus Christ, even though you think you do. You'll have a perverted image of who Jesus is, and you'll, you'll follow Him right into hell. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, He says, There will be many come in My name. Many of them will be private, personal thoughts of who Jesus is in your own head because you didn't come to the Word of God to find out who He is. Moses and the prophets. Don't you let anybody in any church or any Christian TV station or radio station tell you you don't need the Old Testament. You need the full counsel of the Word of God if you're going to know God. Amen. And he says plainly, if they don't believe this, they're not going to believe Him. Now the thing that we want to come back to in this message, this happened. So listen, listen to me. Somewhere today, Right now as we speak, this rich man is still, this same rich man is still in the same torment some 2,000 years later has still never gotten any quench to that thirst. Imagine that. Lazarus has been elevated and set free from Abraham's bosom and is now awaiting his re restored body, his, his, his glorified body like with, with us when we get ours. He's been taken out from there. Jesus freed him. But the, the rich man, he will be there through all eternity. That is truth that's now. That's not a parable. How many, if you're online or on, on the radio, I, I can't see it, but how many, has anybody in here ever been bitten by a snake? Has anybody ever had a snake bite? 
Wow. Nobody. Nobody here has been bitten by That's a good thing. How many of you, how many of you see a snake going to go the other way? Okay, that's, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. A funny thing about that, there's a very real fear in a snake bite. Now, Jesus said something interesting in John chapter 3 when he was talking to Nicodemus. He just kind of came out of nowhere after he was telling Nicodemus about being born again and how to be born again and how to believe. If you remember two verses later in 3.16, he said, Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish. We're talking about the different kind of belief. We're talking about here. believing. Believing that if they catch you speeding, they're going to pull you out of your car, beat you up, and throw you in jail. Believing that if you're found without Christ, you're going to be sitting with the rich man someday. You're going to have to get that in your head and believe it because it's true. That's, that's why Madison Avenue has got the devil is CEO. His whole agenda is to keep you happy enough, satisfied enough, numb enough to the Word of God that you don't consider the things that are going to destroy you. Now that rich man is still sitting there. Jesus tells Nicodemus, after he's gone through this whole thing, you've got to be born again, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus, a teacher, knew this in his head, knew it better than anybody probably. And so Jesus, trying to get it through to him, finally he says, Nicodemus, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Amen. Okay, now you've got to know that story. And you go back into the book of Numbers, and it tells about the children of Israel were griping and complaining about the water. They were griping and complaining about this manna. They were so sick of not living in slavery anymore. And having all the food they wanted. That God sent snakes. And the snakes were biting them. And many of them were dying of the snake bites. Now this is way back in the Old Testament. Jesus is telling this story to a, a Sunday school teacher. A Sunday school director. And this director is like listening and trying to get it and trying to get it. And Jesus says, remember this? Remember how they, God told Moses, make a snake out of bronze. Lift it up on a pole. And you tell don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is, this is the whole key of salvation according to Jesus, John chapter 3. He, he, God told Moses, put this snake on a big pole and you tell all the people, if you get bit by the snake, one, the snake, the, the, the bite is going to kill you. It's going to take you down. It's, the, it's sin. It's, what, it's, it's the fruit of your actions. You've been bit by this. Because you were griping and complaining and never satisfied. So you got bit. They get bit by the snake. They're dying. Now they're sorry. They know they've done so. They know they've aggravated God. They know they've made him mad. And Moses is saying, believe. You got bit by a snake. Just look at this one. God said, if you'll look at this and believe that he forgives you, you'll be made well. Go back and read this story. That's why Jesus told that. He said, if you'll just look at it, all it is is a bronze snake. But if you'll look at it and believe. Believe what God said. What did we say the original sin is? Unbelief. Unbelief. Unbelief is not believing Jesus hanging on the cross took all of my sin and washed me whiter than snow and made me a son of God. Not believing that fully and walking in it. Unbelief unbelief believing that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago does not get you to heaven the devils believe and they're scared to death that's what James tells us that's common knowledge historians know that he lived but looking at him on the cross like the like the children of Israel had to look at the serpent in the wilderness that knowing that believing this is too easy for the carnal mind, you have to look and believe. You have to look at Christ on the cross and you have to... Here's a funny thing. This is one reason that legalism in its true form comes in and, and is so, so deadly to us. Because you get to believing, I've, and this is so, so tricky, I've got to go to church. I've got to go to church. I've got to give so much money. And I've got to say so many Hail Marys. I've got to be sure and bless my food to get to heaven. Does no good at all. Does no good at all. 
Now here's a little secret. Those are things you can't stop doing once you put your faith and you start believing. You're going to listen, if you you may be a Christian and you hadn't darkened the door of a church in 30 years. But I'm going to tell you this, when you look at him on the cross and you recognize that that dead body beaten in innocence and hanging naked with blood all over him was done simply so I could be seen as clean to the father. You'll be at church Sunday. When you see that and you recognize that's what you there ain't no there ain't no wild Beast gonna keep me from getting to church. I gotta be around the people. I gotta be around my people. I gotta. Uh, you're one of them too. Uh, he cleaned me that way. He cleaned me. I believe it. That's the key. When Jesus said, "Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish but have everlasting life," that's the believing he's talking about. Listen. Listen to me, because I, I'm not pointing a finger, I'm not judging. I'm telling you exactly what the Bible tells you. And I'm telling you this so you can find victory. So you can find strength and confidence in knowing who God is. The only way you get it is doing what the Word of God tells you to do. Amen. And what the Word of God tells you to do is believe Look at that serpent on the pole and let the snake bite that you know is going to kill. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. They didn't have Madison Avenue back in the desert. In the wilderness. They didn't have somebody saying, that snake bite's not bad. You're going to be all right. Don't worry about it. Here, take these. You won't feel it anymore. So they walk around on it a little while and then just fall over dead and never felt it. That's how we're living. People go through their whole life and never feel their sin. And so they die and go to hell. And if I preach about sin, they don't want to come here. Because that's bringing me down. I'm here to tell you, we are doomed for hell until we come under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're hopeless. You should know it by now. The devil's given us so much overkill to try to kill the pain that when it wears off for a minute, you recognize we're in trouble. But there's no trouble if you look to Christ on that cross. That's where all of the salvation is. There's a point of no return. And we touched on that a minute ago. And in the, in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, and I'm not going to read this to you for time's sake, but please write this down. Revelation 16, start at verse 8 and go down through 21 and listen to this scenario. This is in the, the, the battle of Armageddon. This is in the end time is what he's talking about. Now I want you to consider this. You've already seen the church raptured out. You've already come to recognize that God of the Bible was really God and it's happened. You're seeing hailstones of fire coming out of the sky. It says, the Bible says in this passage that the heat was scorching the skin on men and they have boils and sores on them from their sin and curses. And it says, those very same men are cursing God and shaking their fist at Him. There comes a point. There comes a point there are people around us right now that will not hear the word of God. They want nothing to do with it. There are others in churches. They hate God. They hate God. Do you not understand this? What Jesus was saying when he said, Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. A wolf doesn't put on a sheep's clothing so he can go out and hang with the other wolves. He puts it on so he can slither right in here and try to find one of you and take you down. There are those that even when they see Almighty God, instead of crying out and saying, forgive me, forgive me, take this away, give me relief, I repent. Instead, they curse God. And they'll be cursing Him from hell through all eternity. As God just lets it. The Bible says in Psalm 2, He just laughs. That's the Word of God. You need to know these things. Finally, as we close, Deuteronomy 30, 19. Sin and life and death. Here's how simple it is. I could preach the rest of the day about how we got in this mess, but that's not important. You, most of you understand just from how much life you've already drank so far. You understand that death reigns in this world. Unfeeling people. Uncaring people. That'll do things that you trust. That'll do things that just rip your heart out. That's the world we're living in. That's the death. That's the sin of this world. But our Father, 
My Father. 1 John 3, 2, my Father. I can say that. He told us all the way back in Deuteronomy. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Today, it's this simple. Paul said in Romans 10, he said, how do we come to this kind of faith? How do we find this kind of salvation? And Paul said, it's in your lips, it's on your tongue. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. God said right there in Deuteronomy, way back there. He said, if you'll just look and believe and choose life. Choose life. When you choose life, you look, you must do this. Listen, hopeless sinner listening on the radio, listen to me. You've got to look at Jesus and imagine him on the cross, broken, unconscious, dying. So this mess you're in can be a do-over starting right now. And the glorious God of all heaven and earth will change your heart right now just like he did me and make you a new creation. All you do is believe.